tonight, a whole evening of TV in one program. Birds of a Feather. The Fash Show. And watch out, Bumble's about. As well as Sally Gonnell, Kelly Holmes, David Lloyd and John Fashionu giving his first interview since being acquitted in the great match-fixing trial. There's Sports Minister Tony Banks becoming a sports reporter. Any Chelsea supporters in the room? Maybe. It's a moment for Chelsea to cherish. Spurs welcome their new Christian Messiah. Colin McRae joins us from the RAC rally. And flying in from Lahore after destroying the West Indies, one of the world's great cricketers, Wazim Akram. First up, first up, would you welcome the most successful woman in the history of British athletics and the natural successor to her crown, two very fast ladies, Sally Gunnell and Kelly Holmes. <laughs> Now, before we talk about you two, we must talk about the state of your sport, which is yes. in a complete shambles, isn't it? You know, the British Athletics Federation bankrupt. Whose fault is that? No one seems to be coming forward and uh, owing up, and it, it just seems strange. I mean, people have talked about it for the last couple of years, but, you know, at the beginning of the year, we were all negoti negotiating contracts, and everything seemed to be fine, and then we find literally at the end of the year, that's it. You know, we've got no money, and the athletes aren't getting paid, and the sport is in ruins, and you wonder why. What, what is the reason behind it? How much money are you, are you owed, Kelly? Um, well, we're all owed, obviously, money from the year's performance. Me, um, not enough, because <laughs> I didn't complete the season. Um, but everyone is owed down from sort of grassroots level and upwards, and that's a sad thing. You know, some people rely totally on their income from um, competing for their country, and that is where the shame But you're owed is. several thousand pounds, and people like Jonathan yeah, Edwards are owed tens of thousand pounds, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, I am owed some money, and, you know, it's, it's hard for us, very hard. So what is the solution to this? Because this was the great sport, wasn't it? You know, you go back to the Co and the Ovet era and then on to your era with, with Linford. What, what's gone wrong with the sport? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel as though it deserves to be in the state it is for sure. You know, it is a great sport and we've got so many champions out there. I mean, I think the only way we've got to look at it now is that maybe something good's going to come out of this. I think in some ways it needs someone with a big figurehead to go in there and sort it out and sort it out commercially. Maybe it needs um, the grassroots being taken away and BAF should really be looking after the grassroots, which is the up-and-coming athletes, the Commonwealth Games, the, the Olympics and those sort of things. And, and maybe the sponsorship and the TV should be taken out of the equation and put somewhere else. And uh, I think we're just waiting for the right person to come in there. I mean, we know David Moorcroft's in there. He's got a hard job yeah. to do. But if anyone can do it, I think a lot of the athletes believe he can do it. But you've called it quits now. Kelly, you're still going strong. Yeah. I mean, when you look around you, do you think athletics is still vibrant? I do. We've got a lot of p potential um, in athletics and there are some up-and-coming youngsters at the moment. Um, it's just getting it right. I mean, people s try to compare athletics with football and, and things and it, it isn't quite the same, but it could be as popular. And I think, you know, there's things that have gone wrong in the past and people just tend to, tend to keep on them and think, oh, there's no co and no vet anymore. Um, why bother being interested? But there are athletes out there that are going to, you know, make the mark, but there needs the support. And without the support, we won't get anywhere, you know. So, yes, the Federation's gone down, but, you know, there's, there's reasons why that's happened, and hopefully um, something positive will come out of mm. it at the end. Uh, talk about being positive, almost positive discrimination, actually, and it may be our fault. You're the first two women that we've had on this programme, and it's the fifth mm. programme of the series. And, you know, beforehand we were sort of discussing this in the office, saying, well, who could you get on? Mm. And we don't seem to produce women sports stars in this country. Why do you think that is? I think a lot of it is that um, the women don't seem to be helped all the way. They're almost, I don't know, no, we need encouragement all the way through. And I think in some ways it's, you're almost knocked down. I mean, when I look back to 
to myself. I mean, I won a silver medal in, in 1991, and it meant absolutely nothing. You know, and I look at the guys. It was, you know, John Regis and Linford and Colin or whatever. They'd been up there and were big names, and it literally took me to get my gold medal in '92 before I'd actually got my name up there. Mm. It just seems to be a struggle, and I think a lot of women need encouragement. They need that sort of like determination to get there, and, and they're not being, you know, encouraged in the right direction. You is, mentioned, sorry, you mentioned your gold medal in '92, but actually, wasn't that was what inspired you to actually take up athletics again? Um, yeah, '92 Olympics, obviously. Um, I wanted to go in the Olympics, I wanted to be in there since I was 14 and yeah, seeing you know, people achieve things and obviously Sally coming back with a gold medal, I mean, you know, it inspires anyone to keep going. Um, but just going back to about the women's sport, I mean, we have got one hell of a lot of talent in women's sport in this country and the reason why um, you know, it doesn't seem like there's any women's sport is because they're not promoted enough and it goes back to, you know, they don't get any recognition, um, things aren't televised as much as men's sports. There are the women out there and we've got some very talented sports women, it's just that they don't get the recognition for it. And I think, you know, there's a lot of people you can have on here that have competed for England in their various sports, you know, time and time again. And, you know, you need to get them on and there needs to be more recognition for them. Sure. You could have won so many medals in the last couple of years, and I know you're heartily sick of talking about injuries. Mm. Assuming you're healthy now, what are your targets for the future? Um, my main target's obviously got to be the Olympics in the year 2000. Um, that's the long-term aim. Uh, Short-term, it's actually getting through a championship without um, becoming injured at a <laughs> crucial time, which is easier said than done. Um, but, you know, um, next year's European Champs, Commonwealth Games, so hopefully, you know, European Champs will perform very well there and we gain a title at the Commonwealth. On a more contentious term. issue, you were the world record holder at 1500 metres last year for a while and then you suddenly found yourself 13th on the rankings because all these 15, 16, 17 year old Chinese <laughs> girls were running these amazing times on, on caterpillar blood and all this sort of stuff. Um, can you offer any sort of, can you offer some sort of logical explanation for this? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> um, it's quite a sort of um, hard subject really. Um, you know, everybody immediately says, oh, they must be on, you know, the big D word and, and everything. But Drugs. We, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. <laughs> um, everyone obviously assumes um, this is happening. And, um, you know, I could be very biased and say, you know, 13 people have overtaken my time and the 17 year old has only been running for a year. There's no way it can happen. And in my heart and in my head, that's what I believe. Mm. But um, you're innocent until you're proven guilty as far as the sport is concerned and Chinese are a completely different world from us, completely different worlds. I mean we hear about the training that they do, you know, the um, marathons they run a day and all this training that they get in there, very institutionalised and that is their life and you've got to wonder, well, you know, if winning a championship, which they have every four years, if they, if they only go to that and don't go to any other championships, where That's we enough. go to championships sure. to win medals, mm. they obviously have to win their championship to have a better life maybe in China. Yeah. So mm. you've got to think, do they really put all that work in um, and get that for a better life? The problem is. Or are they getting assisted? Yeah. And, and me looking at it really as an athlete and as we know, I mean, we put in you know, one hell of a lot of work and to get where I did last year, I mm. mean, I worked very hard for that sort of time, and I think you just can't do it without assistance. Let, let's, let's talk about happier things, just very quickly, uh, Sally. Eric, your horse, is this a serious assault, you and your horse, on the <laughs> Olympic Games? Um, not me, personally. Uh, yeah, I want to get that right. Lots of people have said that. No, I mean, I'm, I'm riding just for fun and everything like that. Eric is um, very much a very talented young horse, and he's, you know, our aim is to try and train him along with the jockey to, to get to Sydney in 2000 sure. or 2004. So, a bit of fun. Well, a bit of fun, and no matter how embarrassing that effort might be, it can't be as embarrassing as your gotcha oh, no. on Noel's <laughs> house party. Oh, For you, would you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what we do as an exercise is this. I'm just going to... Can I just put this down the back there? <laughs> just hold a bit and I'll just get it onto... That's it. Now, now you've got the right posture. Let's just practice doing that. <laughs> Good evening. This is the news and I'm sending <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three bags full. One for the master, one for the dame, and one for the little boy who lived down the lane. <laughs> I knew it would come back.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got you, got you again. The <laughs> clock's running away with this. G good luck away from athletics, but let's hope yeah. you can contribute something to it in the future. Sort of, maybe you're the next Mary Peters, putting it all back in. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. It deserves it for sure. And Kelly, good luck. Thanks Let's hope the injuries stay away and uh, here's to a gold medal or two next year. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sally Gunnell and Kelly Holmes. to learn that the most watched single sporting event in the entire calendar is taking place at the moment. Around two and a half million people have been standing out in the rain and the cold, often in pitch black, watching the Network Q RAC rally. And this time tomorrow, Britain could have the world rallying champion once again. Colin McRae has to win, with his nearest rival Tommy Mackinnon out of the first six to regain his title. And Colin is at race headquarters at Cheltenham. Good evening to you, Colin. Evening. <laughs> Just uh, tell us what the state of play is at the moment. At the moment, this evening, we've finished first equal with Richard Burns uh, and Tommy Mackin is lying sixth at the moment. And uh, has he got any technical problems? Because we understand that maybe his car might not be 100%. Yeah, I heard the rumour that he had some problems, but I'm not exactly sure what it is, so I'm going to go and try and find out after this. Now, you're, OK, you're lying first, and if he finishes sixth tomorrow, you don't become champion by one point. How does that scenario affect how you drive tomorrow? Do you go for it recklessly, or do you sort of play the percentages a bit? No, I mean, you never go for it recklessly, obviously. We're, uh, it's all in a fine line. Uh, we've been flat out today. I'll be flat out again tomorrow to try and beat Richard. There's absolutely no chance of the championship if we don't win the rally, so really my goal tomorrow is to try and win the rally. Well, you mentioned today, some of the conditions were pretty dreadful, weren't they? I mean, first thing, the fog was horrendous, wasn't it? Well, that was our problem this morning. We lost almost a minute and a half to Richard. Uh, we started the stage in the dark, and it was very, very foggy. You could hardly see the, the front of the bonnet of the car, so we dropped a minute and a half there, and we've been all day just playing catch-up. And you did improve, mind you, as the, weather, as the weather improved throughout the afternoon? Yeah, obviously, after the first stage, it improved, and... I was feeling confident with the car, the tyres were working well and we, we caught back up to equal with Richard tonight. Now here we are at this ungodly hour tonight, what time are you up tomorrow morning? Uh, I'll need to be up about quarter to four tomorrow morning. So how much sleep are you going to get tonight? <laughs> well, hopefully when I finish here I can go straight back and have a shower and get as much sleep as possible. Will you toss and turn knowing that the World Championship could be yours tomorrow? Uh, we'll wait and see really, a lot depends on Tommy but... Uh, there's no, no real pressure on Tommy, provided his car's OK, he's going to finish in sixth place easy and take the point that he needs. Uh, but I've also got Richard Burns to worry about as well. OK. And how, how much would it mean to you to be world champion once again? It would be great, especially after the misfortune we've had in the middle of this year. We've really been fighting back very strongly for the second half of the year. And obviously to get the championship in front of the home crowd would be a bit special. Absolutely. Well, Colin, sleep tight. Thanks for talking to us uh, at this uh, very late hour. Colin McRae, everybody. <laughs> and coverage continues of the RAC on BBC Two tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Well, coming up shortly, John Fashionu, Spurs against Crystal Palace, David Lloyd and Wazzy Makram. But time was when the only qualification a footballer needed was a cultured left foot. These days, managers are multilingual and football is no longer just a sport, it's a billion dollar business. Who better then to report on, wait for it, Britain's first ever A-level course in football than Sports Minister Tony Banks. There's the business side. $2.8 million. Yeah, running costs, the accounts, exactly. In my days when I was a kid, A-levels were all about Latin and Greek and stuff like that. And sport was something that was strictly for leisure. But here at Oldborough Manor in Maidstone, they've got every schoolboy's dream. An A-level in footy. Someone watching the ball, of course! Work it, 30 seconds, hard work, watching the ball! Yes, sir. 
Believed to be the first of its kind in Europe, the cause is actually equivalent to three A-levels in PE and a GNVQ in advanced business, with a focus on football. There'll be plenty of tears, sweat and blood, but if your heart's in the right place... Remember, this is stretched and the artery is going to squeeze the blood. We had a number of students who came to us that said they'd like to go into football, but they thought it was too big a gamble to give up two years of their lives uh, as apprentices at football clubs and then to be told, sorry, you haven't made the grade and to leave with nothing. What we're giving them is two years of studying the sport they love, being coached to a high level, have trials with a professional club, and at the end they leave with qualifications of a high level all based around the sport. Any Chelsea supporters in the room? Well, maybe. It's a moment for Chelsea to cherish their first major trophy for 26 years. Oxford United's community education programme enables the students to see how a first division club is run and to get some real competition, as stressed by teacher and coach Stuart Roberts. Um, they need to play against quite a lot of position to see what you know to see the standard they need to rise to. And to manager Dennis Smith, the potential for clubs is obvious. Football is changing very quickly, going far more commercial. And if these boys can work on both sides, just the management side, the financial side of a running of a football club and getting insight, besides their ability to play football, then that could be very useful for the future for a lot of football clubs. So that's the official seal of approval. What about the classroom? You've got qualification, then you're going to get looked at. I just think if you've got.